Good evening and welcome to this, our second week of digital thinkings. We used to have thinkings that were in our newsroom and then we rebranded them digital thinkings and now we're just going to call them thinkings because for the time being this is the way we're going to be doing them. Uh, I'm James Harding, I'm an editor and co-founder of Tortoise and thank you. I know a lot of people are working from home, a lot of people are spending a lot of time on their phones or on video conferences, so the fact you're making time to be part of this conversation means a lot to us. This conversation particularly, tonight we're going to talk about the infodemic and what we can ta do to tackle the viral spread of fake news. We've got a group of people who really know a great deal about it, but if you've never been to a thinking, let me just for a minute explain the, the underlying idea, the thinking behind what we're trying to do at Tortoise. Our feeling is that we need to find a forum for civilized disagreement and we need to find a way of having a system for organized listening. The idea was to do that in our newsroom, in a physical place, but we've actually discovered, even in the course of a week, that a newsroom is actually a place where people come together to discuss the issues of the day. And so what we would like to do is take the model of a news meeting and hear from as many people as possible. So we have one rule in the thinking, and the one rule is no questions. Even though we've got some really, really wise owls who've joined us this evening, what we really want to do is hear your experience, particularly around fake news, but also your ideas, your thoughts about how we can tackle it. And the way that this works, and the way that it really works you know, amazingly well, we're discovering, is that we've got a couple of ways for everyone to get engaged. One is that you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there is a, there's a toolbar. There are a bunch of different things you can do. Uh, one of those things says participants. And if you click on the box that says participants, you'll see that a bunch of names comes up. But most importantly, you'll see there's a little gray box that says raise hand. And if you click on it, suddenly your hand pops up, a little blue digital hand pops up. And that means that I can see that you'll have something to say and you'll enjoy join the conversation. There's also a function next to participants, which is chat. And that means if you just click on that, you can write something. And my colleague, the mighty editor, Basha Cummings, who's been the editor of the, the big piece of investigative work that we did and published this morning on the infodemic is online there. I've already seen her inviting you to get involved. Hello everyone, says Basha. So please do weigh in with uh, thoughts that you've got. Hello, here she is, she says. So please do weigh in. I'm gonna just test whether you were listening at all to that rather garbled uh, instruction on how this system works by starting off by asking a question which is whether or not the way in which we're thinking about fake news in the course of this pandemic is, if you like, already out of date, that we are so informed by what happened in 2016 and the politics of public platforms that we are losing sight of the real threat here, which is what's happening on peer-to-peer -peer encrypted or private messaging groups. And I just wanted to know who here or how many people here think there's a bigger problem in WhatsApp messaging groups than there is on Twitter or Facebook. If you think that WhatsApp messaging groups and they're like a more, more worrying, more problematic, then please raise your hand. So, so far, hang on, here they come. We can begin to see how many people have we got there? That is a lot of people. We're going to capture the number and check how many people that is. Now, in order that we're fully testing how this works, can I ask you, so that you don't tire out your digital hands, to now, oh my goodness, seems as though the majority of people are actually saying, oh no, the majority of people still think that the major platforms are the problem. Can I just ask, those people who don't want to speak now, please lower your hand. You'll see you just press a tab that says lower your hand. If anyone wants to weigh in right at the start and explain why they think the WhatsApp groups, the private networks, are more worrying than the public platforms, will you just raise your hand again and I'll come to you. Very good. Can, can I, 
I'm, I'm going to, if I may, just um, for the very reason you're right at the top of the list here, um, Theodora, there you are. Hello there. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. So um, you I hope I pronounced your name right. Will you tell us why you think that um, that, that the, the private networks, the sort of WhatsApps are the problem? Um, well, I mean, I'm originally from Romania, so I think that especially now with this whole situation, I can see my, I can give like the personal example from my own family, uh, where my mom keeps sending me like, um, which I actually believe that really, it's really fake news through WhatsApp because she thinks, oh, you know what, my friend just sent that to me and I'm going to pass it over because I'm not going to bother checking the information and checking the source. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, send it over to as many friends as possible. So I think it's kind of like we surround ourselves with people, you know, obviously in our bubble. And this is obviously uh, happening on um, bigger platforms as well. Like, and I'm sure you're going to touch upon that um, later on, like Facebook and so on and so forth. But on WhatsApp is, I suppose, is because we are like, it's a more intimate platform in a way, because obviously you give your number technically to your friend, right? Or, um, um, or a person that you get along with, right? You are, you tend possibly to trust that person right. more, yes. I suppose. Um, so yeah, I suppose this is kind of the reason why I'm trying to understand my mom's logic in, um, in that sense. And also I'm passionate about this topic because I'm a journalism graduate. So yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I like the, uh, the message that, um, that Martin Eglinton has put on the chat function already saying, well, how can you possibly know? And I guess that's the problem here is that it's very difficult to, to know. I'm going to come, if I may, to someone else. There's someone here called K1. Hello. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just coming coming at you. Tell, tell us, you, you're more concerned about these private messaging groups than the big social media platforms. Indeed, um, and I think just to build on um, the previous speaker, I think for me it's one the level of intimacy, which I think, um, like she rightly pointed out, you're talking about your core circle. You talk about your family. You talk about your friends, um, and unlike I think other um, social media sites, the much more sort of you know big pillar. Um, um, social media um, giants, if you will, there's a way that you could almost tune those out that you necessarily can't do with um, with family. Well, and I think there's a way that even the um, um, I mean, thinking more around sort of the uh, the the mental issue um, that that sort of arises with you when you you have your mother sort of sending you all sorts of messages that you're like, well, no, that doesn't look right. Calm mm. down, like you know, it's it's it's. I don't think that's that's correct. If you double check with you know, um, core, um, you know, sources of truth, whether it's the WHO or, you know, I mean, just sources of authority. So I think, I think for me, that's, that's my same worry. Um, yeah, I, I'll just leave I, it I think, I mean, I mean, okay, I'll tell you the reason why I think it's interesting. I think there's a point, isn't there, about trust, i.e. you say things yeah. that are more intimate, but also these right. private groups are there to tell you things that are not in the public domain. And so that also leads to a certain, uh, you know, a, a propensity to say things that are more likely to be exaggerated or therefore possibly untrue. Absolutely, and I think the, the, the lack of objectivity, um, yeah. I think for me that's, that, that's, that, that's the worrying bit as well. It's like, you know, it's, it's just filled with a lot of um, hearsay, you know, it's not, it hasn't gone through, it hasn't been stress tested, you know, it hasn't gone through like the actual sort of protocol that is required to, um, I think, you know, sort of, you know, equip us with, you know, the right information so we could, you know, act accordingly. Especially in these like dire, you know, dire times. But, yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a really there, actually there's a, someone on the on the line called Meredith Leston who's actually put this much better than me that WhatsApp groups can sometimes encourage this perverse competitiveness with who has the most incendiary, frightening news story. Um, I, I certainly I certainly recognise uh, recognise that. I'm I'm going to come if I I'm made to may to uh, Tobin. Trev, I'm going to pronounce your name. Is it Trevathan? Uh, Tobin, can I just uh, come to you? Are you there? Yes, hello. Um, I hope you can, we can hear you. Uh, let me just make sure we can. Yes, can we? Yes, far away. I think so. Yes, yeah. there you are. I'm fascinated with this because uh, I live in uh, Northern California, right outside of uh, Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, WhatsApp is something that I use uh, on a global context with partners around the world, but not so much uh, locally here. So, uh, I'm just fascinated by the whole subject matter. 
Uh, Twitter is almost to a point where I've turned it off now because I just, I can't deal with it. Uh, but to the comments echoed by the uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, it is that intimacy thing that's kind of frightening because it's uh, an encrypted network of who knows what's flowing through that. And uh, the fact that uh, it can kind of stay invisible uh, is what makes me concerned mostly. But, but Tottenham, let me understand that you, but you, you've, the interesting thing is you switched off Twitter because of the noise, but you kept on your WhatsApp groups? Yes, I have several of those because those are my uh, global touch points. Uh, to me, the stream of conscience from Twitter is just overwhelming. So, uh, you know, given the fact that in California we're shut down, uh, we're locked at home, uh, I just don't need any more of that kind of negative noise. So I've kind of suppressed it. Well, there, there is a, there's a, there's the, the, the first constructive intervention of the night has come from a, some called Assad in the chat function who says that the forward function on WhatsApp is to blame, that if Facebook could limit that, that we might have a chance. I've got to say, I can see the point, although of course the forward function is the one thing that keeps us laughing at these times because the best, you know, the best jokes are the ones that are distributed in that way. I'm going to do something which is, which is a rather intricate and elaborate boast now, which is ask Alexi Mostras, who's one of the reporters alongside Ella Hollywood, who's worked on a, a sort of deep look at misinformation to, to come in. Alexi, will you just, I know I've kind of kicked off by talking about peer-to-peer -peer and WhatsApp groups, but you actually have had a chance to look at, uh, in conjunction with a research group in Italy, have had a proper look at Twitter in particular and Facebook more broadly. Uh, how much is the infodemic uh, sort of snappy title and a figment of our imagination, or how serious a problem do we have about uh, reliable data and reliable facts in the course of this whole crisis? It, it, it's, a, it's a really serious pro problem. There was a, a report uh, by uh, British researchers last year that, uh, that linked, uh, for the first time, I think, misinformation on, on, epidemic, uh, on epidemics to the, to the scale and the seriousness of, of the epidemic itself. Uh, so there is a causal link between, between the two. Now, uh, as, as you mentioned uh, before, James, we're kind of limited in analyzing the extent of this information by uh, the networks themselves. So, so Twitter, with its 300 odd million users, is pretty much the only social network uh, that lets uh, data analysts, scientists analyze its data. And, and these guys in Italy, who who we worked with, um, started collecting tweets that mentioned the coronavirus uh, back in January. So, relatively early on in the process, before many people had had. Um, got uh, an idea of the, the, the scale of it. And so they, their database, which now stands at about 140 million tweets, is a really, really good um, database to look at the extent of misinformation around uh, the coronavirus. And, and a couple of really interesting conclusions can be, can be drawn from their data. The first is that just on Twitter, there are 46,000 posts linking to websites with misinformation on that are published on Twitter every single day. Um, so every day in March, almost 50,000 posts were published that contained uh, misinformation. And that, that's just from one social network. Uh, 56,000, uh, sorry, 46,000 individual posts. Individual posts, yeah. Uh, and, and about 40% of those posts came from bots or accounts that weren't controlled by humans. And we're just starting to dig into this data right now. So in the coming weeks, I think we'll be able to say a little bit more about where those bots come from, whether there was any concerted efforts to propagate uh, misinformation. But it's like you, you, you've gone to the, the, the um, Arctic Circle on an expedition and can see the top of the iceberg because there's a huge amount underneath the surface that we can't see uh, because platforms like uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google, and, uh, and Facebook, uh, which owns WhatsApp, just don't let data analysts and scientists scrape the data to, uh, to the same extent that Twitter does. So even before you get to encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, which, were, which are kind of the worst of them all in terms of monitoring, uh, platforms where you can monitor in real time, like Facebook, don't allow you to properly scrape the information, which allows you to to get a, get a full sense of the problem. So um, I think part of the 
part of the pressure is going to come on technolo technology companies to say it, in this case that uh, COVID-19 is so serious that they can't just ameliorate the problem using techniques that they've put in place before, that there is an argument for saying, okay, let third parties have access to their databases to actually work out what kind of misinformation problem we're dealing with. Is, I'm going to I'm going to try and pick up on a few things, um, but for the, the elaborate boast is saying do read Alexi and Ella's piece because it's really very good. Um, there's 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 a long post in the chat lines which I want to come back to and Emma Hartley. I don't know whether or not you joined right at the beginning, so don't may not know how to raise your blue digital hand. But just for people who did join a little later, on the bottom there's a toolbar at the bottom of the screen. It says participants. If you click on it, you'll see there's a little there are a couple of grey boxes. Um, at the bottom of the list of names, one of them says raise hand. So if you do that, um, uh, that'll pop up and I'll come to you. Otherwise, I'll try and find you uh, because if people see in the chat function, ah, oh, she's done it immediately. Emma, I'm going to come to you um, uh, in one moment. But before I do that, I just wanted to pick up a point that's sort of raised by Andrew Sebke. I hope I pronounced your name right, Andrew, which is it's all very well to say, let's stop doing the things that are difficult. Uh, let's, let's stop people, you know, um, advancing false information. Why don't we make the truth? Why don't we make real facts more interesting and use the kind of viral technologies of social media to do just that? Um, Will Moy uh, from Full Fact is here and spends his every waking hour trying to disseminate uh, facts and um, make sure that things that are untruths and lies are exposed for being just that. Where are you, Will? There you are. So, so Will, can you just take on Andrew's point? Is it just much more difficult to make the truth go viral than it is to make things that are untrue or um, at least very exaggerated uh, light up the, the web? No, not necessarily, but often. Um, there's no special quality of the truth that makes it easier to share and very often it's easier to make up false things that are fun and compelling and rewarded by clicks or votes or money depending on what your priorities are. In a world with more information than ever, it has become harder than ever to know what to trust. And we know that there are people out there trying to exploit that for political or financial gain. And we also know at the, at the moment, lots of people are sharing information that hurts other people um, without necessarily wanting to hurt other people, but because they aren't aware that what they're sharing is false. And we're seeing that um, in full fact in all kinds of places. It's not just online. Uh, the Daily Express ran a story that um, the coronavirus was modified to target humans, um, that we had to get them to correct. Um, based in the loosest possible sense on a misreading of a piece of research. Um, there is a danger here of saying that we are trying to tackle false information online. And listening to some of the comments we've already heard, you would think that everybody would just agree, every good sensical person would agree that we should be able to surveil every conversation everybody is having, work out whether it's true or not, and intervene. And that's a terrifying idea. Yes. It is absolutely true that bad information ruins lives. And it's never been clearer than in the last couple of weeks. Giving people good information can save lives. And that's what Full Fact is working all the time to do. We would never suggest that the response should be that every conversation is looked at by some kind of authority and interventions come into that. Ever since communications technologies expanded, whether it was writing, which Socrates complained about, or the printing press, which Parliament licensed, right up to modern licensing and broadcasting. Somebody has said, oh my goodness, people will use this to spread all this false information and the world will end. Well, where we need to focus the conversation, I think, is on reducing the harm that bad information does. And that's where Full Fact tries to put the focus of our work. So we're working with government at the moment, um, we're fact-checking the government too, and they've made some false claims, uh, for example, about the amount of testing um, that's going on. But we're also working with the government, we're working with the internet companies to identify the kind of harmful content we're seeing and work out what are effective responses to that. And Will, can you just do... Will, sorry. Yeah. Go, go. 
I'm just going to interrupt you for one second. Can you just give us some context? Because you do this for a living, and obviously there are these spikes in misinformation, disinformation that we've kind of grown accustomed to around elections and around certain areas of politics and, I suppose, certain kinds of scams. What's difficult is to get some context for what we're seeing now around coronavirus and whether or not this is essentially something that is of a type with the... Uh, kinds of fake news that you've got used to on social media or on the internet, or whether something particular is happening now around the pandemic? My opinion, um, some of my colleagues are on this call, I'd be fascinated if they had a different take. It's actually remarkably predictable what we're seeing. We're seeing false claims about what the health, health effects are and how to protect yourself. False claims like gargling salt water can protect you from the virus. This is not true. We're seeing false claims about the origin and how various people might have conspired to hide their knowledge of this virus. Um, we're seeing false claims about what governments are doing in response to it. This is exactly the kind of variance of false harmful information we often see. So for example, one very predictable thing was people linking the virus with 5G. Now, if you monitor online um, conversations as much as we do, you wouldn't be surprised to see that kind of false information being circulated. Um, another very predictable thing, sadly, were claims that the Rothschilds, um, famous Jewish family, had um, a patent on um, uh, vaccine for the virus and that they in some way were able to prevent it but were choosing not to. Um, classic anti-Semitic tropes. I'm afraid these are you know, human, um, typically human reactions to a scary situation we're seeing at large scale because there aren't many conversations which are truly global conversations and this is one of them. But actually the patterns of the things people are worried about are the very basic human things we are used to human beings worrying about. That's really, Will, that's really interesting. I'm going to try and find in a minute your colleague, Claire Milne, who I think's joined us, who's actually been trying to uh, debunk some of the specific false claims around um, uh, around coronavirus virus and C19, exactly as you say. Um, I, I seem to have lost Emma Hartley, but I am going to, if I may come to some of the other people who, who are here, uh, Leslie Moroni is there. Hello. Um, Leslie, I think you've got your hand up, uh, and I hope... I oh, did you not? I was just trying to discover how to do it. <laughs> well, that's good. It's very, very good to do this. It's apparently very, very good. You know, it's a form of dancing and exercise uh, that we can take. Well, I'm glad that your digital hand had a, had a, had a stretch. Um, I've now got it and I'll use it appropriately. In the okay, v very good. I'm going to, if, 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 well, well, then uh, it's nice to speak to you. Very nice to see you. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, there's, I, um, Brittany Kaiser is uh, here and on the line and I'd like to, if I can, come to you, um, Brittany, because uh, many people will recognise you um, uh, from, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, but they're basically the great hack. global <laughs> fame. No, no, I, I know it's called great, the great hack, but I was actually going to say global fame must be one of those weird things where you've been, spent your life not being in the spotlight, and then actually I imagine everywhere you go, people say, isn't that the one I saw her in that movie, the great hack? Um, yes. But, but Brittany, can, can you give us some sense? Because obviously, you know, you worked, you know, for some time thinking about information, the responsible use of information, uh, the irresponsible use of information, mm -hmm. information to manipulate. Absolutely. When you stand back and you look now at what's happening, what, what do you make of Will Moy's point that actually what's happening around C-19 mm -hmm. is quite predictable? Um, I would say it's very predictable, and I'm seeing a lot of the same fake news patterns as um, as we saw from the beginning of this election cycle and back in 2016. So targeted misinformation is being sent specifically to groups of people to keep them at home. And in my opinion, it was very successful uh, during the past primaries and caucuses that we had in the United States. And 
I'm very glad that there were at least decisions to move up some of the primaries and caucuses to the end of May and the end of June, because right now so many people are afraid to go out and therefore they're not voting. I mean, we're, we're seeing very low turnout um, from the time that coronavirus started becoming a big problem. Uh, and there were still elections going on, hardly anybody was showing up and they were definitely afraid to stand in line for hours or enter into a crowded building. And it wasn't everyone that was afraid. You know, if you look at different news sources and different, different targeted information campaigns, they're being sent to different people in different states and different areas of different belief patterns, uh, you know, in, in a very purposeful manner. And that's been incredibly obvious to me and a couple of the other experts that I work with. And that's what I find to be very concerning because, um, you know, obviously more money goes into politics in the US than anywhere else, but this is now a global problem and it will be used, you know, to, to suppress votes in other countries, absolutely. Um, there will be some people where it will be difficult for them to figure out um, how to vote from home or vote remotely if they've never done that before. Um, we've seen such massive problems with the uh, first caucuses and primaries that were using um, digital voting uh, that a lot of people are not going to trust that. So the amount of individuals that we're going to see not participating in politics because they are afraid of contracting coronavirus for leaving their homes and they're not sure of how to vote absentee um, or, or vote digitally it is a huge issue. I mean, luckily in the United States, we've uh, tested blockchain voting in five different states already. So it, at least there's, there's some innovation happening in this sector. But I think the, the targeted misinformation and fake news campaigns in, in certain areas are going to completely change what the outcome of many elections would look like. Can I, but Brittany, the... Going back to the point that we started the conversation around WhatsApp, uh, it was striking to me that when the, the the film about you and about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica came out, actually it almost coincided with the arguments that were beginning to take hold in Brazil mm -hmm. about manipulation of WhatsApp groups. And so we were talking about public platforms while they were talking about these private groups. I imagine that one of the issues in, in the US democracy in this election year is it's very, very hard to measure how those private groups, the WhatsApp groups, are being used. Are there, are there any people who are doing any, any good work on that front? I know WhatsApp doesn't have quite the same penetration in the US as it does, um, you know, in Europe or in South America, but is there anyone who's doing good work on that front? Um, there definitely is, but unfortunately, it's quite difficult. The only organization that has access to all of WhatsApp's data is Facebook. Um, right. And uh, well, I'm, I'm not gonna say that, that they're doing very much good work. They could be spending a lot more money investing into policing disinformation on WhatsApp. And, and I'm not really seeing the moves that I, I hoped to see in order to, um, to think that we're going to be safer later this year in our election or anywhere else. And it definitely concerns me a lot more in other countries in the US where WhatsApp really is a utility um, in, in many ways. Um, when I lived in Mexico in, in 2017, uh, most, most phones give you free use of WhatsApp even if you don't have any, um, any credit on your phone for texting or for internet usage. So it, it really is installed like a utility in, in very many countries. And um, I, you know, I'm especially concerned uh, about the amount of influence that advertisers and political advertising has within the Facebook ecosystem and that Mark Zuckerberg has um, weakened the encryption on WhatsApp in order to pull more data from WhatsApp to, to target people on, on his other platforms. So I think it's not just within WhatsApp that's the problem, but it's the fact that WhatsApp is part of the uh, Instagram and Facebook infrastructure and that they now share databases and data sources, um, which is one of the main reasons why in the United States a, a, a lot of um, a lot of legislators and activists are working to try to re-separate those those companies because WhatsApp has now been um, you know the the main oh am I the am I the one only one who's just lost Brittany or have we all lost Brittany we've all okay we've so it sounds like a 
Well, hopefully Brittany will come back and join us in a moment. But it means there's so many hands up, I can come to some of, uh, some of those. Uh, Emma Hartley, I said I would come to you. Um, Emma, you mentioned something really... Hello. You mentioned Hello. something really interesting about... I don't know whether people saw it in the chat. W would you just explain about WhatsApp groups and the idea that these community groups are going to be a great thing and then possibly not? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you very well. Great. Um, some, something a bit peculiar happened to me last night. I've got to say, I'm not a great aficionado of WhatsApp. It might be something to do with my demographic, but um, my experience of it until now has been really just uh, family groups, to be honest. Um, and then over the last week, I've been invited to join this, um, this group in my local street. Uh, which is great because um, I'm here in the house on my own and I'm a little bit worried about getting ill and it's nice to think that you're not going to be stuck on your own with no means of getting any food if you do come down sick. So I was really pleased to be invited to join this group. Um, and last night, I don't know whether it was cabin fever on my part um, or what really, but I started looking into the links that had been sent to me by the person who started this group. I just followed them like, as far as they would go. And um, what I found was that most of them actually led back to uh, sites that were to do with trans activism, which right. um, is uh, an interesting thing that I've been thinking about a lot over the last week because of what's happened to Suzanne Moore at The Guardian. Um, which was, I don't know about the rest of you, but it, to me it was quite surprising. Um, and it sort of made me think about trans activists in a new way. So to find that um, all of these links led back to people who were quite um, involved in that aspect of politics in this country uh, just gave me pause for thought. Now I'm not saying um, because I had a very lovely conversation today with one of the people who started this group, who seems very genuine, very nice, but she isn't the person who posted these links. And they said that there are 1,500 similar groups that have been rolled out across the country. And I was just thinking that actually, I mean, there is a huge demand for this at the moment. Yes. You know, and it's, it's quite a force in its own way. Um, and although I, I, I can't see that they're going to be using this for a political purpose in the short term, um, it's, if it works and it's very successful, um, this particular network will certainly be able to claim a huge victory at the end for isn't, trans activism. Isn't the issue, I mean, isn't, isn't the issue, Emma, because I haven't seen the posts and don't really know the context, the thing that strikes me about this that's really difficult is that if you post something on a public platform, at least I can see who you are, assuming you don't take anonymity or use a bot, but I can see who you are and then go to the platform and seek to hold the platform accountable for the publication of that view or, a, you know, asserted fact. Within the confines of these groups, the WhatsApps, etc., it's impossible to do that. And it's impossible really to ask your peers to police the conversation. So I, I think you point to something that is really quite systemic, which is how do you make sure that, th that the truth or opinions are fairly handled, accurately handled within these communities? And I, I don't have an answer for it. I just know that it's there. Well, to be honest, I, 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 the thing that I'm concerned about with this um, is the longer term implications of it. Because although, um, I mean, I'm, I'm on quite good terms with many of my neighbours anyway, but it's really interesting to have been introduced to a whole bunch of new ones as a result of this group. And, and I credit the people who've done that because right. it's, it's a great thing to have done under the present circumstances. It's a really important thing to have done. And I can see that, you know, once you start multiplying that by, you know, 1500, that's an awful lot of kudos that is going to be applied to a political cause, which I feel very equivocal about because of what's recently happened to Suzanne Moore. Okay, I think well, that's really interesting. And, and Emma, thank you. I'm going to come to some of the other people who got their hands up. I'm hoping, is Amy Ansari there? Is that there? There you are. Amy Ansari against that wonderful yellow wall. How great. It's really bright and lively. Um, uh, Amy, I know that we've got very local just talking to Emma, but one of the things that we're trying to understand, and I suppose, you know, Translators Without Borders, you're organization, if I understand, will help us get a sense of this, is that I'm imagining that the truth and 
um, the exaggeration or distortions of the truth differs greatly country by country, community by co community. Is, is that right or is that just a guess? Uh, I'm not sure the truth does. The distortion of the truth certainly does yeah. differ. differ um, I mean, if there's truth, uh, differs quite a lot between uh, languages. Uh, we are, Translators Without Borders right now is doing quite a lot of media monitoring around coronavirus, but we've done me media monitoring uh, around all kinds of different, uh, mostly crises. Uh, this has been very, very interesting for us because, for example, um, in Tagalog, right now, uh, the tr one of the trending topics is that boiled garlic water will cure coronavirus. Um, but in um, simplified Chinese, for example, um, smelling onions and putting them near your bed will cure coronavirus. Um, so there's all this just incredible misinformation going on in, in very, very different languages. So even if you, even if it's on Twitter, even if it's on Facebook, Unless you know what they're talking about, you can't do keyword monitoring, you can't do sentiment right. analysis, you can't do any of that digital monitoring. Your algorithms don't pick it up unless you know what you're looking for. Right. Yeah. Um, no, and, so the, and, and, and how do you. The problem is, is that if you're not monitoring in those languages, yes. you just look at like um, uh, what happened in Myanmar. Uh, Facebook didn't have enough Burmese translators. And, and all of this terrible information that was essentially inciting people to attack the Rohingya uh, was happening in Burmese, but nobody could read it except the Burmese. Um, there, is, there is, I think, a very important point here that you make, uh, Amy, and, um, uh, and my friend and, and former colleague Ravin Samput makes this point about how within Indian communities, the you know, turmeric will fix everything WhatsApp message is doing the rounds, but not necessarily in others, and why that means that in a lot of shops, uh, turmeric's run out. There's a, there's a sort of kind of um, charming observation to that, but there's a deep and much more worrying fact behind it, which is that particularly Facebook is essentially a global platform but still operates with quite a US mindset and so I suppose what you're seeing there is a business that doesn't necessarily apply the same resources to fact checking in Tagalog or in in in, um, in Chinese I, mean, I don't know about Chinese use of Facebook to be fair but in, in other languages well I mean that's not uh, we're monitoring Weibo as well right so, and what, you know, and what and, and do you find is, is that the I guess what I'm trying to get at do you think that what we've got here is essentially an, an inequality of access to fact and fact checking by by country and economics? What, what we're seeing is the supremacy of the English language. All the information, almost all of the primary information is in English. Sometimes it's quite complicated and quite complicated in medical terms. So right. it's difficult to translate, first of all. And secondly, you can only get it in English. So even if you're trying to check facts and you speak Tagalog or Korean, it's quite yeah. difficult to get that information in those languages. So all you have is the rumor, all you have is the misinformation. And Amy, uh, Brittany Kaiser, who's come back happily, just made yay. this point that yes, <laughs> made this point that everyone can call their legislator and ask for big tech regulation. The, do, have you found that actually there's any appetite to go to Capitol Hill and ask them to legislate with an eye to countries outside the English language? I've not asked if there is any appetite for that. Um, and I can't, and on Capitol Hill, I, I don't think that that would, that would be something that they would be particularly interested in. They're interested in English and they might stretch to Spanish. Right. Um, I, I see a lot more of that. Um, you see it a lot more in India. You see it in, in Sri Lanka or in, in um, countries where they have big problems with lots of languages and lots of misinformation. Um, I, I've not seen it very much in the US. The US accepts the supremacy of the English language. Yeah, um, Amy, I'm, I'm going to go, if I may, to Angelo Carusson. Uh, I hope, Angelo, I'm pronouncing your name uh, right. But Angelo, um, I know that some of the work you're doing is actually about trying to tackle this. And, and we did build this as an attempt to say, OK, what are the progressive answers that might, uh, that, that might end up with better outcomes? Um, what's your view on what can be done 
Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about digital literacy. There's a lot of talk about holding the platforms to account. What's your view on this? So I'll actually start where you began and then sort of walk through the solution. Uh, you know, when I think about WhatsApp versus, you know, as a source of the problem versus Facebook or other platforms, it, you know, one thing that we look at and it gets to the solution side is there are two sort of functions, right? One is as a distributor of information or bad information in this case, there's also another really important function that communities like WhatsApp and social media more broadly, but especially the ones that are more peer to peer have, um, which is that in a weird way, the most effective form of fighting misinformation is actually a similar way that you fight viruses, which is inoculation. Right. Um, and that is the single most effective way to deal with intentional efforts to poison a conversation is to actually identify the narrative, get in front of it, and actually have people within the community that not just are aware that there are efforts to uh, spread misinformation and aware of what that misinformation is, but are actually acting in order to stop it from spreading and distributing. Um, that's long been our model. And this gets into how we think about the problem more broadly. And sorry, Angela, just, just to interrupt yeah. for one thing, so I did a lousy job of in, uh, introducing you. You're the president of Media Matters for America, right? Yes, that's right. And so uh, we're a media watchdog. So that's exactly. So your job is to try to find some answers to this. Sorry, go on. That's right. And so we, um, and so the way that we've largely tackled it over the years is, and it's gotten more complicated, but it's still the same, which is that um, misinformation has a food chain. Right. It all sort of starts in the same places and then spreads. You know, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of the most destructive forms of misinformation were starting in, you know, bad actors, organizations, think tanks that were intentionally trying to distort or even some bad publications and then getting into the food chain and sort of working its way up to larger and larger outlets. What we found in 2016 was that a lot of the, mis the stuff that became fake news the kernels that built up those false stories that were then masquerading uh, as real news under you know, articles that, and from headlines in places that sounded authentic was actually starting on these online message board communities like 4chan right. and 8chan. They were building the ingredients or the clues or the pieces of evidence. You know, they would go to Craigslist, make up an ad, take the screenshot, then post it to you know, 4chan as like the evidence that George Soros was hiring protesters. And so all that's to say, when, we, when you sort of start from that perspective, whether it's misinformation on WhatsApp or on Facebook uh, or distributing on Twitter, um, it is oftentimes rehashing or regurgitation of very similar and consistent narratives uh, or the same piece of misinformation. Um, maybe there'll be slight variations. So, you know, uh, a good example of this, and that'll sort of stop is in the UK a few years ago, in London in particular, MMR vaccination rates dropped by a very dramatic perspective, really yeah. fast. And it was seemingly strange, right? It's like, we, they, you know, they knew that there were bots that were amplifying a bunch of disinformation around um, vaccines. But one of the missing pieces of that was, because um, there's always been sort of misinformation as what happened at the beginning of the food chain. And when we went back and did an analysis, what we found was that in a lot of the Facebook communities, um, uh, you know, parenting websites, uh, family websites, health websites, there was this sudden surge of anecdotes or personal stories about I gave my kid a vaccine or one of my family members had a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And all of those anecdotes sort of poisoning the well at the bottom of the food chain meant that a whole bunch of bad actors on the bottom at the back end of the spectrum using bots and artificial amplification yes had a larger pool of stories to pull from. And what we found is a lot of those stories were not from real people. They were right. from sock puppet accounts, fake accounts that were designed to poison the well from the beginning. And this gets into the solutions because when you start to think about it from the perspective of, okay, a lot of these things are gonna incubate in different communities, different places, and then they're gonna be regurgitated or passed back and forth. A lot of the most viral content we've seen on Facebook has actually been screenshots of WhatsApp and other private messaging conversations yes. that are being sort of repurposed. Yes. Um, and so once you do that, you can just like weather patterns, you can identify the indicators yes. um, and then start to identify and articulate what the countermeasures are. In the case Angela, of the images and videos, it's trackable. In other places, you can develop others. And, and Andrew, can I, can, I just, can I just make an obvious point there? What you seem to be describing then is that we can sometimes mistake the echo chamber for the source and that actually the source is mostly intentional it has a deliberate 
aim in one se one sense or another. I, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not an expression of mood and misunderstanding. There is, there are deliberate actors at the heart of this. Without a doubt, and a lot of times, and this gets into it, you know, sometimes you can identify the source of misinformation or the kind, and then get ahead of it. Right. A lot of times, though, what we found is. Um, there's a, you know, if you look on some of these communities, you see very consistent types of postings uh, or really similar languages uh, or similar articulation of how they're writing it across different message boards. It's, or right. sometimes they mess up and it's the same person posting under multiple identities across right. multiple boards. That means that there's an intentional effort to misinform. And in terms of solutions, there's one that's much more dynamic that looks at the indicators and looks at the narrative and tries to track it that way. There's another, which is that a lot of the times the platforms don't uh, hold some of these individuals accountable at all, right. especially for social influencers, which is that if you're a social influencer, you have, every, you have perverse incentives sometimes to post the worst forms of misinformation. Uh, but Facebook or Twitter or TikTok won't take away your account if you're a three strikes person who keeps doing it, right? So in fact, you keep getting rewarded even though you're supposed to be getting shamed. And then I'll close with saying that you know, one of the things about WhatsApp that I think cuts both ways too, is that one, it's, we are, it is eroding a really important prophylactic power that it has right now to inoculate communities against misinformation. The bright side of that though, is that it's normative, that we can change that, right? I mean, a lot of these communities don't have, you know, with uh, just the, these same communities that are spreading misinformation right now around coronavirus, um, you people I wouldn't go in there and post extremely racist vulgarities or other things, right? Because they wouldn't want the blowback. They understand right. that there would be a social cost of doing so. We haven't gotten to the place yet. I, I think there's a lot for media literacy, don't get me wrong, I'm not dismissing it, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's just good old fashioned norms, which right. is that we haven't gotten to the point yet where it will cost you, there will be a social cost to being somebody that distributes misinformation. You mean into, shame, yeah. shame on us. Uh, uh, Angela, that's, that's really, really helpful, thank you. Thank uh, you and thank actually, you. fun enough, you do raise a point there in terms of uh, the, you know, this sort of bizarre incentives for particularly social influencers. Um, Tom Westgarth, if you look at the chat, just made a really smart point, which is why isn't the government, why aren't people with facts marshalling those people who've got access to very, very large audiences to help, you know, reverse this tide? I'm, I'm just going to go if I can, Angelo, forgive me, I'm just going to go if I can. There are a couple of people here who've worked on the digital literacy, on the news literacy front. Tracy Brown has put her hand up and John Silver too. So I'm going to go if I may, I don't know, Tracy, if you're there, Yes, you are. Hello. Yeah, um, uh, Tracy, would you tell us, I mean, Sense About Science is, is right in this argument. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing. And, uh, and you made this point in the chat here that there's quite a bit of misunderstanding about the nature of WhatsApp chats. Yeah, uh, I think, I think so. I think it's one of those things where, uh, sorry, am I, am I unmuted yet? No, no, you're here. We, we okay, all get it. Um, yeah. So um, I, I think it's one of those things where, I mean, it's kind of a, a bit along the lines of what Will was saying earlier, that um, what's happened is we've suddenly taken a really big interest in um, the online equivalent of pub chats, um, where people say all sorts of nonsense and self-elect uh, as an authority on all sorts of things, uh, like the best qualification to have and all sorts of things like that. You know, that's normal in pub chat. People, people um, elect themselves uh, as, as authorities. Uh, in that moment and you're seeing a lot of that at the moment and we're caring about it because normally we don't care a great deal about that we know that broadly speaking to give you a parallel people often share with each other all sorts of dodgy cure stuff uh, and alternative medicine but we know that when they're seriously ill they go to the NHS that's broadly how society works right. yes, they talk yeah. a lot of nonsense about what to do about a rash but largely if it's a, you know if it's seriously they they seek proper authority and there's a handful of cases where that doesn't happen and it, and it has consequences but by and large that's how it works suddenly it has consequences that people might not play ball with a major public health announcement and we're really interested therefore uh, in that I think um, in the discussion about it there's a few things that we're missing about the nature of I mean we can't get our arms around this people are sending out recordings you know whatsapp is is a primary uh, a primary kind of um, platform to circulate YouTube uh, videos and you know it, it's just something that will be very hard to track and chase and pin down and for all sorts of civil liberties reasons we wouldn't want to. Uh, 
But what I think we're missing in the process of hand wringing about that is that a number of other things are happening here. First of all, fortunately, the volume of this of this sort of um, rubbish stories is so great and so repetitive. It's really easy for people to see the themes behind it. I heard a fantastic thing last night. One of my kids played me, uh, warning people about the fact that we're going into lockdown. Somebody, some dad's hairdresser's brother, uh, works at the Ministry of Defence, um, and they know, but they can't tell us yet because they have to make a giant lasagna. Right, but at yes. that point in the whole thing, it was just it was brilliantly done. Um, and you know, I've always pointed out to people the phrase "it's that's clickbait, mate." Kind of emerged from the masses, telling yeah. each other, "Stop putting rubbish on my Facebook page." Uh, there are spontaneous responses to this going on and we should you know, look for those and elevate them and celebrate them and not just talk about the fact that people are so willing to, to share rubbish. There's also a lot of sensible people out there finding clever ways of yes. drawing these things out. And, and so let's first of all acknowledge that and, and, and do more to celebrate and, and, and um, uh, escalate that. The, the other thing is I think a lot of the material that traditionally kind of um, the science community and others trying to put out is, is too confrontational for other people to share. You right, know, if yeah. your Auntie Sue has just posted something that's a complete load of nonsense, it's very hard to then post on your own, own Facebook page something that looks like you're doing a takedown of your Auntie Sue. Right. Uh, or in your WhatsApp family group or whatever. What you need is stuff that is a little bit more general. Uh, so either along the lines of the humorous thing I've just mentioned, or that's just slightly general enough, a bit more declamatory about myself and my values or whatever. There's, there's ways that we can equip this better, I think. Um, uh, at the moment, I think, you know, we, we're just, people don't feel comfortable, A, in terms of their own expertise to back up what they share uh, that's supposedly a takedown. Uh, and they just don't feel comfortable doing a takedown. So we have to look at the, the, the tone of what's being shared and the implication of it and make things that are a little bit easier for people to share. That brings me to my third point. Um, you know, go, go along with the whole thing about getting ahead of the story. So what we're finding is it's good to tell people what's going to happen when we increase testing. For yes. example, when we increase testing, it's going to suddenly look like nothing the government's doing is working. Right. So let's say that ahead of time and why that would be wrong to think. Um, right. So, you know, we need to do more on that. And finally, I think big voices, um, you know, in, social influences are great and they really do work in certain circumstances. But also I think we, we rely on a massive ambassador network to get out into many, many conversations. And I right. think that's ultimately where a lot of this stuff's going through. We're doing a campaign of the week with Mumsnet. Um, in a week. And, and, and I think, you know, those are the sorts of um, networks we need to work through as well. Okay, Tracy, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to come at a uh, pace to a, to, a, to a few people. I said I would come back to Claire Milne, because Claire, you've been actually working on some of these things directly, debunking things that are untrue. Can you give us some examples, Claire, of the kinds of things that have come up. And actually, while I'm asking you, if anybody else has got examples, not necessarily giant lasagnas, but examples of uh, things that were plainly untrue, but have been doing the rounds, it would be useful for us to know them, to be able to look into it. Claire, what, what kinds of things have, you know, sort of crossed your screen? Yeah, so we've seen lots of different kinds of posts as well. We're saying a lot of them have similarities with things that we would be checking at a, a more normal time. Um, so, you know, posts related to 5G, that the, sim the symptoms of um, COVID-19 are actually just the symptoms of exposure to 5G, um, which of course there's, there's no evidence for at all. Um, we've also seen things that, about simple um, preventions and cures that you can do at home. So posts that involve, you know, gargling salty water will stop you from getting this new coronavirus or will prevent you from, from having, um, will cure you once you have it. Um, we've, we've seen a lot that revolve around um, the misunderstanding of the fact that we are calling it a coronavirus um, and, and what that actually means. Um, so all sorts of different posts and the most common one we've seen I think revolves around a picture of a bottle of Dettol. So incredibly relatable, everyone has a bottle of Dettol in the mm -hmm. kitchen cupboard somewhere. Um, and on the back of it, it says that it is effective against human coronaviruses. Um, so this spawned so many different posts about, oh, well, Dettol knew about it a long time ago. Why did Dettol know about it? Is it because people have been keeping this virus from us? Um, and also posts that, that use that to say, well, if Dettol can kill it, then clearly it's not going to be that harmful to me. 
Uh, and this all stems from the misunderstanding, as I said, of what exactly a coronavirus is, the fact that it's actually a broad name for a family of viruses that includes things like SARS and the common cold, as well as this new coronavirus that has just emerged. So there's a lot of different posts that revolve around that, the patents, um, posts about patents and vaccines and things that Will mentioned earlier. A lot of those focus on patents for, for old coronaviruses are ones that we've known about for, for a long time and, and vaccines that have been trialed for those as well. And people saying that this must mean that vaccines already exist. Right, That's right. Uh, it, it's a very interesting, I saw one particular thread about that, about renaming a, a virus that was actually first being explored in 2015. And it's, it's a small amount of science, you know, uh, misapplied. Claire, it's really helpful and, and particularly given um, what you're doing at Full Fact, uh, as you know, I'm a fan, so I would, point people to go and have a look at it. Um, uh, thank you. I'm going to try and come because we've just got a few minutes uh, left. Either Hester McCreary has had that little blue hand up for a long time by mistake or uh, you're there and uh, want to join us. Um, Hester, I hope that you are. Can we hear you? Oh. Can you hear me? Can yes, you guys hear me? There you are. Hey, you can hear me this time. And you've got Hi, the fairy yeah. lights on and the whole thing, so we're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, this is a comment um, I thought I had much earlier on in the conversation, to be honest. Um, and, and it's, it's it, I don't know, I don't work in this, this sort of spread of fake news, so I don't have any context to bring like that. Um, but from a sort of historian point of view, um, I, I just kind of wanted to raise what's with the spread of fake news and misinformation that's going on, what's happening to people's, uh, the mass spread of hysteria is really quite worrying to me from my perspective. And I'm aware, I don't know if anyone's heard of um, uh, the dancing plague that happened in the 16th century in Strasbourg. But from a historian's point of view, what's happening now is, is really quite scary because there was this sort of dancing plague um, and, um, um, people basically have for a long time people thought it was mold in the flower that has like hallucinogenic properties like lsd that made people dance until they died literally danced until they died but there's a there's a historian john waller who's written a book a time to dance a time to die that's really quite relevant now i think and what he thinks it's only a theory but what he thinks is has happened is possibly not mold in the flower it's possibly mass hysteria it was the living conditions that these peasants in Strasbourg in the 16th century were in were so very poor. There was so much nervous energy and tension in their body. They, they literally had to get it out. And so they sort of started moving and dancing and danced until they died. And that's, I, I know it's a horrible comment to make at this point, but with so much spread of fake news and misinformation, I just sort of, from a historian point of view, wanted to bring people aware of, of what possibly might be happening out there to try and get people to not do that again um, um well, that's amazing i mean that's a, a t uh, what's it called a time to what a time to dance a time to die. a time to dance a time to die um but isn't it just to be just to be fair just has to if i can just look, th there is one argument to be made here which is that actually those periods of history i remember studying those periods of history and what was amazing was the total absence of information right so yes. one advantage of our times is that we do have access to a to you know, a level of detail in terms of information, you know, what Imperial put out last week. It's inconceivable that that would have been widely available even 25 years ago, let alone, you know, 500 years ago. So maybe, you know, there is a point, you know, as we come towards the end here to make, which is that the difference between now and 500 years ago is that that was just so widespread, the total widespread, the total absence of reliable information. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, I, I, I'd hope so, I'd hope so, but so, something, I guess something that holds, holds still is that how fear spreads in the mind, and how we've, yes, we've I... got to get people away, away from this misinformation, and, and, and away from whatever's happening out there online, to back to the reality of it, yes. Right, well I'm going to, I'm going to give the last word to one other person who's had their hand up for a long time, who may also have just done that by mistake, but Ollie Scott, there you are. Uh, Ollie, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, you, you're you're going to get the last word before we wrap up. I, I suppose the thing I would, I'd just like to point out on, on all of this, and, and I agree with some of the things Angelo uh, was saying earlier, that there appears to be a vacuum on accountability as evidence in the open auction to be more and more alarmist in media and on social media. And I wonder to the extent to which one drives the other and, and vice versa. And, and at the same time, 
the, the, skepticism, the, the skepticism and critical faculties of the general public seem to have eroded um, really quite alarmingly. And, and I wonder whether this is perhaps because we're too trusting of the delivery mechanism, e.g. the device we're reading it on, and mistakenly extending that trust to the apps and the content coming to us via the delivery mechanism. And I, I just, I, I wonder whether um, the, the solution to this perhaps is to, uh, to try and get everyone to just stand back and, and, and just take a breath and ask a question. That was all I uh, Sorry, the, the, to, about, about our relationship with those devices or platforms. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, lots, so many good things come to you through your phone, you know, the emails, you know, your bank statement, you know, all these sorts of things. You know, you, it, you, you, psychologically, the device that's in your hand is something that, that you trust. Uh, but at the same time, some of the apps and, um, and, and information that's coming to you, you are, you, you are trusting the device and, and extending that trust mistakenly, I think, to, to what's on there. You rely on your device and you come to rely, and, and by extension, what's on it. And, and, there, and there needs to be a separation of church and state, in, in, so to speak. All right, well, that is, that is a suitably and, and wonderfully wise uh, point to end on, Ollie. Thank you very much. We've, we've hit 7.30 and we're going to keep to time. If you've been to a thinking before, you'll know that the aim is really to do what my colleague Charles Wattel describes as uh, industrialised intellectual property theft. We, we listen to lots of people and we try and come away with, with ideas. And I think this evening we've come away with, with a good deal. I do think that actually I take a lot of... Um, solace from what Angelo was saying and from what Tracy was saying about the fact that these things we can create new norms in these communities particularly in places like WhatsApp that said I am also struck by the number of comments that said who's holding the platform operators to account specifically I think around the private uh, messaging groups the WhatsApp and the peer-to-peer -peer groups I do think there's something really significant about the, the difference we had in the discussion between what if you like Tobin or Amy were talking about global trends in information and now what a Emma described as some of these very local ones and actually of course there is the feed through from this pandemic into politics uh, new communities and obviously in the US a presidential election year we're going to, as Alexi said right at the top, continue to follow what's happening in some of these data feeds and, and trying to make sure that we get some understanding of what's happening on the big platforms. Please do keep in touch with us about things that you're seeing in private groups. So I hope that you've got um, uh, seen from the chat access to uh, my colleague Basha Cummings, but also to me. You're, it's easy to get hold of me. I'm james.harding at tortoisemedia.com. Please do get in touch with me uh, as well. We'd like to follow up and keep a, uh, an eye on this. Um, this is our second week of these thinkings, things that we're doing remotely. We've learned some wonderful things. One is that we can get access to people on the West Coast. We did one last week uh, where we spoke to a number of people in Shanghai and China, and the thing that comes much, much more intimate and close, except in one regard. When you get to the end of it like this, if you hold the conversation in the newsroom, you are able to sort of give yourself a round of applause for having covered so much ground quite so quickly. Uh, I'm afraid we can't do that, but what we can do is wave at each other cheerfully. So on that note, please wave cheerfully, cheerfully. I was in my, who can I see? Claire, cheerfully. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Well done. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a very good evening. All the best. Bye.